All right, good afternoon, everyone. If you've just uh, arrived, this is uh, Safe and Sustainable Partying uh, with some people from the DanceWise crew. And we're going to be um, starting uh, with the start of DanceWise. It began as Rave Safe, uh, a different named program, but the same one that it's morphed into today. Uh, in 1995, uh, it was first funded by Viv AIDS, which is now Harm Reduction Victoria in 1999. Uh, which means that it's 20 years of funded service for DanceWise this year. Happy birthday, DanceWise, slash rave safe. Um, and uh, o over, the, over those years, it's grown into so grown from something that was uh, much more ad hoc and, and organised um, uh, with an uh, ad, ad hoc spirit, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, to something that's um, a lot more, uh, a lot more process oriented, a lot, a lot larger, uh, attending a number of uh, over 30. In fact, I think it's up to 40 now. Is it? Yeah, it's it's a lot uh, over a one year period. So, uh, it's grown into something much larger. Uh, I'll introduce. Oh, actually, w would you like to? Would you guys like to do a quick intro, or w shall I? Maybe. Yeah. Oh, okay. We'll start with. Um, Melissa, Melissa Dent, uh, who you would have heard from before on the previous panel, was uh, one of the co-founders of Rave Safe uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, when there was a slightly different sort of party scene going on, and she was um, talking a little bit about that. But maybe you could um, talk to us a little bit about um, sort of what, what what sorts of things, what sorts of outreach Rave Safe was doing, the kind of um, uh, the information that you were supplying, where you were getting that information, uh, and how how it was being received in the community. Sure. Um, well, uh, we started out as a collective and so um, people would um, do things based on interest areas um, and then we would come together and um, people would research information and we'd put together just basically a two-sided um, piece of paper folded up um, with some party information and um, they'd, you'd just get the collect the people involved in the collective would they went out to parties er, you know every week uh, so when you went to parties you'd just take some of the information um, maybe have some condoms or other things like that or bottles of water. And basically it was about um, just looking out for people who look like they might need um, a little bit of help. People in trouble or looking distressed or looking a bit lost. Uh, people in the middle of the dance floor with no water going into them. So it was, that, was, that was really what we did. Um, mostly we paid entry to parties, although some promoters were incredibly supportive and would give you free entry so that you could do it, um, which was nice. Thank you, Melissa. And, and part of what um, started this off, I, I, I don't know if you guys got the inspiration. It's a bit hazy. We've been trying to find... Oh, you, you've got it? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. We've got, yeah, um, the origins of um, the Rave Safe. Uh, um, well, the, the concept and the name came from a earlier project by the uh, New South Wales Users and AIDS Association under the Tribes Project. And the Tribes Project was great because it was um, like little communities of drug users could individually apply and do like a peer-based project where you actually developed information that worked for your community. So it was a really good project and um, some... Um, I can't remember the guy's name. Um, I actually have a letter from him somewhere to give you. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, so the guy who um, started it, uh, that peer who put in that application, um, he uh, made a film, uh, which I believe you're going to show. Yes, yes, we are. Um, shall we show it now? Uh, show, it, show it just in after a, second, a couple yes. of sentences. So um, Michael Arnold, the co-founder, um, he um, saw this video and um, he, he loved it. And we also, um, being kind of nerdy as well as drug users, got our information from books. Um, so we literally learned everything from just researching it. We didn't get any kind of the normal verbal handover that people have. Um, and because um, we were nerdy, we also thought this was normal. Um, and um, look, uh, so we took the name and the concept and developed it from there. So here's the, here's the origins. If you want to move up closer to see the screen as well. I'll just quickly mention while it's going because it doesn't have talking in or anything. So this was actually given to a number of um, promoters as well and, and VJs uh, to play at their parties. Uh, if you look through it, there's um, some some uh, safe sex and safe drug use themes uh, in there. Just, you have to look pretty closely because it's all like you know 90s special effects. And a lot of the uh, esoteric imagery as well.
I believe that's the, is that the HIV? HIV virus. Yeah, HIV virus. So that was the rave safe video from, I think it was 93, was it? 93 that it first came out with the tri Tribes Project was 93. That sounds right. Yeah. yeah. So that was where the name and the idea came yeah. from the values. But yeah, the idea of doing something in the rave scene and the name. Um, but the model was quite different because obviously um, the model that that was based on was when there was already government money to do a project. So we were starting from somewhere different. So we based it on just um, community-based organising principles, where you know it's like if it's if information is generated and the questions and answers are generated from within the community that are seeing something that needs to be responded to, then you get something that works. If it comes from outside, it may or may not work. So we we based the model on peer and collective organising, and then later when it came translated into funding, we tried to keep as much of that collective as possible because. Um, if you put more heads together, you're more likely to get the right answer more of the time. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Everyone's too hot for applause. Maybe I'll say you have to give a round of applause. I'll come clap your hands for you. No, it's all right. Uh, our, our next um, speaker is our, our leader, current leader, and um, the uh, coordinator of the DanceWise program, Steph Genetis, uh, who has been a powerhouse uh, she does all sorts of things behind the scenes, works far too many hours, uh, and, and really has a, a, a massive passion uh, for what we do and for keeping people safe. Uh, Steph, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, and, and I do find a little bit, a, a bit gut-churning to hear the term leader because um, what Mel was saying, like it's a community-based program. Um, we're peer-led and it's the work of the volunteers. So all of the strength in the program comes from people wanting to give their time to support their community. So uh, that is the lifeblood of the DanceWise program, always has been, and I hope always will be. Uh, so where we're at right now, um, I've been involved uh, with the program for six years as a coordinator and a year before that as a volunteer. We. We have been receiving government funding for 20 years uh, this year. So that's a significant period of time. And uh, we are grateful for that funding because it means that we are now at a scale where we can attend about 40 events a year, uh, which is quite painful. Um, but but uh, yeah, we, we are at a point that we can go to that many events. But uh, the program has had to formalize because you are receiving government funding. And so that does mean that you're having to balance uh, the, the driving force, the community, uh, and what they focus on as priorities with what um, bureaucrats consider as the most important uh, key performance indicators for you to target strategies and those kind of like buzzwords. I mean, it doesn't really uh, fit well when applied to the people who actually want the harm reduction messaging. 
Um, but just to give you a summary of wh the service at the moment, if you go down uh, to where the medic tent is, the dancewise tent is right next door. We have a front of house with educational resources that have been developed with reference to empirical evidence, but by the people in our team and our extended community. Uh, we also have resources from a range of other agencies that are relevant for people in the scene, for people who use drugs, and that includes uh, mental health resources, uh, know your rights, um, sexual health resources, and the health supplies that empower people to actually um, implement measures so they are reducing their harm. So things like free sexual health supplies, earplugs, sunscreen, all of those kinds of things. And then inside the chill space is um, a space where people who are intoxicated and don't need a medical intervention can receive support. And I hear myself saying that sentence and I actually realize like um, it's almost who don't need a medical intervention. And I'm saying that like a disclaimer because I'm used to saying that in context with stakeholders who aren't necessarily familiar with the service and why it exists. Um, but yeah, so the space is a place where people who are having a difficult drug experience can receive support and it's non-judgmental. Now, um, what the space can look like inside changes quite dramatically within the course of an event and from one event to the next. And that, that can often be because of the, the kinds of drugs that people may be taking at an event. Some events we are elbow deep in vomit because there's a lot of alcohol at the event. Uh, some events we're spending a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with people having a challenging psychedelic experience. Um, but always the most important thing is to make sure that you're, you're taking a non-discriminatory approach in providing people with support. So that is, the, that is the summary of the program as it stands. Uh, but we also like to work with community groups or relevant stakeholders to, s to branch out. And so two examples of that, um, one being the, the, consort the Pill Testing Australia Consortium. We're a member of that and we, uh, were, we participated in the trial in Canberra in April. Um, and the great thing about the Pill Testing Australia approach is that it incorporates um, the scientific approach with a toxicologist on board, uh, as well as the peer-based approach, which is if people get their substance tested and they have an idea of what it is, then there has to be an educational intervention afterwards. Some time for people to consider their behavior, to consider what risks are involved, and maybe to modify their behavior to reduce the risks. And people are more likely to take that information on board if they are hearing it being from someone who's been there and who can relate to the kinds of impulses that that they have as well. Um, if you're hearing something from someone and it just doesn't make sense, um, then you're less likely to take that information on board. So that's the beauty of the peer-based model. Um, another project that we're, we're really excited to be a part of is uh, supporting the SSDP, Students with Sensible Drug Policy, uh, Be Heard, Not Harmed. Uh, and that's beautiful because SSDP has been around only for just over three years now, is that right? And SSDP is still completely grassroots. They recently were successful in getting the Project Labs mentoring funding, which was just for, for a mentoring, how many weeks was it? Uh, uh, yes, six months. Six, yes. Mo six month mentoring um, opportunity, but they're still, the, the volunteers are still doing all the, the hard yards. Uh, so we support them by creating a platform for them to be um, heard on and for us to information share and exchange resources. So those are two examples of how the program has diversified to work with new community groups as they evolve. Um, and yeah, and the program in and of itself is expanding throughout Australia, which is a beautiful thing to see. And it is quite wonderful to see the program come full circle. And there is now, uh, it's in the second year, Dancewise New South Wales. Uh, I'm not sure, that we have, we're collaborating with a couple of crew members from Dancewise New South Wales um, here at Rainbow, which is great. Um, and that was the organization that funded the video that you just saw that gave the name Rave Safe 
to the original iteration of DanceWise. So it's quite cool seeing the cyclic nature of the, of the program. But yeah, I think that in a nutshell is what DanceWise, um, well, where DanceWise is at right now. Um, Steph, you've also, um, she uh, she's travels a lot as well, gets to see this community around the world. As Melissa um, alluded to uh, before, the, the, the idea for the model uh, didn't come from, uh, from the Rave Safe video, it came from other organisations. There's other organisations doing similar things around the world, uh, and Steph is networked with these organisations, speaks to these organisations, and sees how some of them operate as well. Do you want to talk a bit about some of your experiences? Yeah, um, I suppose the the organisation that I um, have worked with that uh, I've found really nourishing is uh, Cosmic Care, uh, that delivers a harm reduction service at Boom Festival in Portugal. Uh, many of you may be aware that in 2001, I believe. Uh, the drug policies were quite radically reformed in Portugal. They decriminalized all substances, so use and possession of uh, quantities for personal use, which equates to about 10 days worth, so it's not just a tokenistic amount. Uh, they're no longer, that's no longer a crime. And what you do when you, um, when you take away the, the kinds of, uh, you take away that criminal kind of label that is attached to that personal use behavior. It opens up the space, it makes it more, it makes it safer to ask questions and to have conversations in your community. You don't have to be underground. So what I notice in Portugal is that yes, they have a harm reduction uh, service that is comparable to what we have here in Australia. But what's quite beautiful is that the conversation is balanced between be aware of the risks, uh, know that you won't be judged, but be aware of the risks and please do your best to reduce them. We're all here to support you, which is what I think we, we try our best to achieve here in Australia, to being able to talk about benefit enhancement. So this idea of, okay, know that these are the risks, but know that these are the ways to actually make it a more pleasurable experience. I think the climate in Australia uh, as well as other countries, uh, a lot of English-speaking countries, particularly the US, there isn't, it's not okay to say those kind of comments uh, because you are very vulnerable to being criticized for promoting drug use, and drug use is perceived as something that should be punished. There's this kind of, the, the debate around drug use gets tied to values when really it could just be simply Let's talk about it in terms of a, a quite normal human impulse. So that's what I observed in Portugal, that they, they really do uh, embrace that there are potential benefits that people can experience, even like rites of passage almost, through some drug experiences. Like just acknowledging that not all drug use is inherently wrong. Uh, and that, that would be my, my main observation between uh, delivering a program like DanceWise in Australia and uh, the Cosmic Care model in Portugal. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to get uh, into some, some nitty-gritty details with um, one of the program officers of DanceWise, Linda. Uh, now, Linda, um, you've got some data for us. Maybe you can contextualise it first and then you can jump into it. And it's going to come up on the screen shortly if you want to see... Uh, see the data in a visual form. Hey everybody, I'm Linda Cowan. I'm one of the project officers at DanceWise. So I have the honor and the luck to work with Steph and Nick. Um, so I've basically looked at some of the data from Rainbow um, from the last six years and just sort of looked at um, what DanceWise has done, you know, service delivery wise at this particular festival. Okay. And you can see we have a lovely uh, lasers, as we all love. Uh, okay, so this is kind of nerdy. I'm warning you now. Feel free to walk away. <laughs> I mean, really don't. Oh, sorry. Okay. So um, Steph gave a really nice introduction about DanceWise, um, but we are a drug and alcohol outreach program run by Harm Reduction Victoria. Um, as Mel said, it was begun as a grassroots initiative in 1994. We've had government funding since 99, which is pretty cool. Um, and we've attended Rainbow from since 2010, so almost eight years, which is pretty cool. Oh, sorry. Ah, 
sorry, we've been attending for much longer, this is before my time, but only collecting data since 2010. Um, in the last year, last six years, DanceWise has grown a lot, and we'll look at the data collected during this time frame. Um, right now we're just looking at service delivery data, like us in the chill space in the tent, not necessarily like drugs that we see at the festival. Okay, this is rainbow, it's the spoons. I took that picture. <laughs> um, so, basically, PIC is the people we care for. We don't call them patients or guests because we want it to be equal. So, you can see from 2013 up till 2018, we've gone from 62 people to 263. That's a huge jump. We take care of a lot of people and we're really excited to do it. And then you can see our hours in care. That's literally, we add up the number of hours that we're taking care of each person. So one person might be 10 hours, the other person might be five minutes. So the first year, we were actively caring for people for just over 240 hours, and that's gone up almost double to 482 hours, and will most likely increase this year. So we're putting a lot of time into caring for people, and more and more people are coming into our space. Um, and then you can see also the total attendees at Rainbow have gone up from 14,000 to 17,500 as of last year. And do you know what it is this year? Okay, and it might be 18,500 um, this year. So Rainbow has increased. Our presence at Rainbow has increased. Um, I, I'd also yeah. say just as a qualifier on the data that the, um, the, I, the recognition of DanceWise has increased a lot more because it just... What, it was hard, it wasn't as well known as our operation wasn't as big. So the numbers don't get bigger because more people get need help necessarily, oh, sorry, that more people, yeah, need help. There might have people already been out there <laughs> uh, who weren't able to find any assistance and could have used it. Yeah, so basically, you know, you can think of lots of reasons why more and more people are coming to see us. Their friends are telling th their friends about a positive experience, they're seeing more messages, say for example, on the Rainbow website, or the safer partying messages coming up. Um, and the more people that come visit us, it leads to greater uptake of services and education. And people then take that to their friends and hopefully spread our harm reduction messages you know, further along. Okay, here's a graph. <laughs> Linda normally um, fills her, screen, uh, her, her PowerPoints with puns. Where are the puns? Wait, yeah. Oh. I normally put puns and things, but I was trying to be professional, which was silly. Um, okay, so what we wanted to look at, out of the, the people that attend um, Rainbow, just your average people walking around, how many people are coming to visit us, visit us in care? So I don't mean you know the thousands, potential thousands of people that might come, pick up some information, grab a condom, that kind of thing, but people that actually come in and we care for, actually in our chill space. So uh, since the number of people at Rainbow has grown, we're looking at this per 1,000 attendees, okay? So you can see in 2013, roughly four out of every 1,000 people attending the festival came to us and we took care of them. And then that has constantly, um, consistently increased from roughly four and a half, five and a half, seven, nine and a half, 13, and then to 15 last year. So that means over six years, we've had roughly three and a half times the number of people come um, to be cared for us in the space. And that's pretty awesome. Yep. 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 Hey. And thank you for coming to hang out with us. We love you. All right, this is a graph break. Pretty pictures. All right. Oh, sorry, God damn it. It's too many computers. <laughs> graph break. All right. Now, we're gonna have another uh, graph, so sorry. <laughs> this is the last graph. Okay, so we look at the average time in care. So for example, all the people that come in, what is the average amount of time you know, for each year? Is it like one hour per person, two hours, that kind of thing? Because we have people come in from everything from five hours to, I'm sorry, five minutes to like 13 hours, just depends on the person. So in 2013, you can see that um, your average person was in for just under four hours. That's a pretty you know, good chunk of time then you can see it's consistently decreased, 3.7, roughly 2.5, 2.5. Then 2017, it went to 2.0, and then last year, 1.8. So that's roughly 50% since six years ago. And so we're looking at possible factors. So you can imagine that 
from 2013, if people come into the space, they felt well cared for, they got some good information, they're gonna go and spread the words with their friends. So the next year, more people come. Um, and then also, people might come in more casually. So not coming in necessarily when things are getting really bad and they're super stressed out, having a really challenging time, but they might come in earlier and thus alleviate the symptoms instead of waiting you know, longer and it might be a bit more challenging or they now might need medical intervention. Um, and keep in mind that this includes everybody in our care and that includes drug related, mental health related. Some people are just really hot and need a place to sleep. So we're including everybody that we're caring for. Um, and also increased knowledge about the space leads to higher uptake of our harm reduction messages. So maybe that is filtering out through the community and then people are needing less time actually in our space. Yep. So, oh. this is the cutest DanceWise volunteer, my cat. <laughs> she likes to hang out in the DanceWise banner. Thank you for your time. <laughs> we'll, we'll do some questions um, at the end. Steph, did you want to add anything on um, uh, data? I know we were talking before, David, speaking about the devil being in the data, and I know that uh, it can uh, be a little confusing just to look at uh, figures. Um, uh, we've got had a little bit of context, but was there anything you wanted to add on that? No, I Thank you, Linda. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I, like, I see it as a really positive thing that our numbers, uh, our, the number of people we're having contact with is going up, but only so long as the severity of the presentation um, is going down. So we want DanceWise to be a place where people uh, feel empowered in the space rather than end up, if they're lucky, uh, or, yeah, so the number of people coming into care, yes, it might be steadily going up, but the graph is being mirrored by the average time in care going down. I would be concerned if the numbers were going up and we weren't seeing any decline in the severity of the presentations. We want people to um, yeah, be empowered and uh, seek an intervention or support sooner rather than later. So that's the whole point, yeah. Uh, can I just have a show of hands? Who's been into the DanceWise safe just to have a look at the information, uh, see what's there, have a chat with somebody? So that's about half of the people here, which is great. Um, and if you do get a chance, we're up by medical, um, and go and say hello, go and have a chat with the DanceWise volunteers there. Now, uh, Nick Kent is one of the DanceWise volunteers, but um, as, as we heard before, also the uh, like one of the co-founders of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Uh, and Nick's going to talk to us a little bit from, from that peer, peer, uh, peer perspective. Peer's pers perspective, yeah. Cool. <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks, Nick. Um, thank you, everyone. It's really nice to be up here. Um, talking about DanceWise. I fucking love DanceWise. <laughs> um, so I'm the National Director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy Australia. Um, and as Nick said, I also volunteer with the DanceWise team um, and I've been doing both for about the last three years. Um, so I'm not sure I said this on the previous panel as well, but I, I basically found this whole space right here at the Cocoon in 2016 um, at these such panels um, and didn't really know a whole lot about harm reduction before that to be honest um, but I knew that that how we um, how we talk about drugs in society is messed up and um, and the, I knew that the people who were using those drugs um, and the people who actually had that experience on the ground weren't being part of the conversation and that was what was really annoying me um, so that's the kind of place at which I come at this conversation it is as a peer um, and as someone who um, enjoys these places more than anything um, so I guess that um, in terms of like safe and sustainable partying, what the panel's about, um, I guess what I can add to that, um, whilst we've heard about the, how the program runs and what it's like on the ground, um, I guess what Students for Sensible Drug Policy can help bring to the conversation is just a bit of um, commentary on the policy space around it and how that impacts um, what we have on the ground here, or more importantly, what we don't have on the ground here, which I'll, I'll get to in a sec. Um, and um, yeah, so basically um, SSDP is a grass, as Steph said, a grassroots youth led organization um, as well. Um, and so therefore the stuff that we come up with, the way that we're able to have conversations with people, building on that kind of yeah, peer based principle, 
um, uh, we believe are ultimately more effective than um, in terms of reaching our demographic um, and connecting them to the evidence base around drugs than en any other organization apart from DanceWise. Um, and because of that, um, there's a huge sense of actually family, I would say. Um, and to borrow a term from SAS, cross-pollination is one you use sometimes. Um, so there's a range of organizations of which DanceWise and Students for Sensible Drug Policy are part of a broader movement. And we're all part of each other, really. So there's a heap of SSDP people who also spend their time doing DanceWise volunteering and vice versa. Um, and so it is really a, a grassroots community um, across the board that is um, sort of getting packaged up in little organizations and doing, or big organizations, growing organizations, um, and doing stuff to um, get messages out there in different ways. So we want to span the link between young people and literally the like political conversation. Um, so I'll just give a really quick anecdote and then talk a little bit about Be Heard Not Harmed, which is our campaign for, our youth-led campaign for pill testing. Um, so in my role as national director, um, following the first death of this season, of which there's now been five, the majority of which have been in New South Wales, um, there was a parliamentary session called for the New South Wales Parliament that I was invited to um, as a youth representative, which was a huge honour. Um, but I, you know, I got there and there was a round table of like 40 or 50 people and you've got all your academics who are overwhelmingly on side. You've got people like uh, Dr. David Keldicott, um, representatives from the you know, music festival industry and stuff like that. Um, and I was the only person there that was there to represent like young people. And it's because we've got like a safe brand. We're students for sensible drug policy. It's okay to allow me at the table. Um, and yeah, that's something that deserves further conversation actually. But um, I sort of had never been in a parliamentary session before. I waited till the end to speak. Didn't really know how it was gonna go. Um, I fumbled my words a tiny bit, but I basically said the message that like, it's been lovely to hear all you talk about this and deep respect for all your support and that we need pill testing and everything. But I've heard all this before. I've heard all this for years. So has everyone else. And we're still not breaking through and we're still not changing policy. And why is that? And if you ask me um, what I think and what has been shown to be the case over the last few months is that there's no organized youth voice in this debate. When someone dies and when the media discourse and narrative plays out over the following days, um, it is overwhelmingly out of touch premiers and police commissioners that get to control the conversation. And it's not people who know what's happening on the ground. It's not people who know, you know, it's, it's generally not people who've even read evidence about what would address these festival related deaths and harms. Um, and that's why we have poor policy and that's why we have poor outcomes and that is why people are dying. And, um, you know, if you look at other areas of activism or you just look at, um, I suppose, where society is going in many ways is that there is a growth in this appreciation for the idea of lived experience. You know, like if you want to talk about racial injustice, your lived experience as someone who's not white is therefore more valid. Or you want to talk about feminism, you're a woman, that's more valid. You know, your, your opinions take priority. And that doesn't exist for people who use drugs. That doesn't exist for people who enjoy festivals. Um, and that's, that's a huge gap in the conversation. And so SSDP is trying, you know, to, to use that seat at the table um, to wedge that conversation in further. And we've developed, with the help of our, our mentors at the Centre for Australian Progress, um, a campaign. Um, and this campaign, so those mentors have worked for organizations like GetUp, um, the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, the Wilderness Society, the Australian Conservation Foundation. So organizations that have been running massive professional and successful campaigns for decades. Um, myself and Gulliver, uh, our deputy director, uh, participated in that program and really gained a lot of that knowledge about how to do that in a technical way, all the infrastructure involved in that, all the governance stuff, all the technicalities around that. And we have that knowledge now and we've rolled out a campaign um, that we've launched in Melbourne and Sydney now. Um, and there's some further Sydney events coming up. There'll be plenty more Melbourne stuff planned too. Um, and it's basically our national youth-led campaign to change the conversation around pill testing, to allow young people, not just myself up here, increasingly any other young person who wants to grab a microphone and talk about it, wants to speak to their local MPs and talk about it, uh, wants to speak to their family or their school or their institute, like university, whatever, giving people the language, the skills, the confidence, and uh, like, to be honest, the brand to be able to do that. Um, so that was the inspiration for it. And I suppose what's made this campaign possible is that community-oriented, peer-based 
appreciation for community that we share with DanceWise. Um, and it was a seed I planted in Steph's head a few months, a fair few months ago. Like, let's do this campaign together. Um, let's be, you know, a bit out there. Let's talk about pill testing at the festival. Let's put posters up. Let's get a petition. Let's, like, get this... These people who don't have a voice added right. to the conversation. I always can't That's help myself. Let's what we're going to do. I'll oh, shut up oh. now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Uh, round of applause. Um, we've got a bit of time for some questions now. If you have a question, please come up here. I'll give you this microphone. Uh, we need to put it on microphone because it's being recorded. Is, uh, is there anyone who has any questions, queries for the DanceWise program, for how uh, drug policy works in Australia right now, for students for sensible drug policy, uh, not... No, no, no questions. Gosh, can I? Can't? Linda, huh? I mean, this person. I have a question for Nick Wallace. Oh, sure. How do we um, sign the petition? Oh yes. Uh, if you would like right, to Nick sign Ed. the, <laughs> you could have asked Nick Ed as well. Um, there's Nick. two, two Nicks. There's lots of Nicks. Um, there is a market stall in the markets. Um, do, do you know the grid reference actually? I know it's in the middle, but I don't know. You, you're probably not looking around at grid references anyway. If you walk around that that way, it's uh, in the middle, sort of up behind the chill stage. Um, and there you can sign a petition. Uh, and for also the at the DanceWise space, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and at the DanceWise space, there's petitions there as well. Uh, there's also these T-shirts for sale uh, for $50. And um, there are a number of books as well with the uh, Psychedelic Society and flyers for a, a bunch of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Thank you for your question. Uh, more questions? Yes, come Hello. Um, I just wanted to see if you would talk a little bit about like the people who visit the DanceWise tent, what kind of harm reduction or like actual kind of benefits you see uh, to their experience, like what, from when they come in, into the tent to when they leave in the end, like what that service has been kind of offered to them. Yes. So just to clarify, you're talking about people who receive care, like rather than just visiting the front of house. Yep. Um, okay. So, so DanceWise is a community-based uh, organization as opposed to a medical model. Um, we work closely with the first aid provider and uh, Colbrow Medics, uh, like a great group. Um, they. What we're doing is we're trying to create a space where if someone doesn't actually need a medical intervention but they do would benefit uh, from being monitored, they can be in a space that's less intimidating. We, It's really subtle things, like the space has softer lighting than say a clinical lighting. Um, we don't wear the high vis uh, necessarily in the space or the furnishings are softer. Uh, so people are able to ride out the experience surrounded by people who uh, understand where they're at because they most likely have been there or somewhere similar as well. Um, they uh, reinforce. We really try to um, encourage people to to not internalize a sense of shame, which um, they might get in a clinical setting, not because they're necessarily being um, discriminated, but because. Um, to overcome stigma, like and, and when you are a person who uses drugs, it's a, a heavily stigmatized uh, lifestyle. Um, it, you need to go above and beyond to really reassure a person that they do deserve care, that their health rights are valid, uh, that they're not a bad person because they've used drugs and they're not a bad person because they needed support through that experience. And so, um, Hopefully, and you never know because it's not a counselling service, and we don't uh, we we keep a care log to make sure that we that we risk manage the situation, that we care we have a duty of care. But they're anonymous records, and we don't have any follow on to see how did this person get on six months down the track or ten years down the track. But what we hope is that people leave that space um, not damaged by the drug experience and not having an internalized sense of shame. So that's what I, that's what we endeavor to, to um, provide for people, just a safe space for them to ride out an experience that is really quite normal in terms of what our human experience is, but are often highly criticized, highly stigmatized, and the stigma that you experience from being someone who uses drugs is more harmful 
than the drug itself. Okay, so that's, that's what we try to combat. We do get a, not, not many, uh, not much feedback, but every now and then we do get feedback and it's all glowingly positive as well from, from people. In fact, usually sometimes it's the next day when somebody couldn't, couldn't quite construct English sentences anymore and they'll come back the next day completely like a normal person and, and say, oh, thank you for whatever they thought was going on. But uh, any other questions, uh, you can come up here. Yes, oh, I'll, come over, I'll come over there, I'll meet you halfway. Um, I haven't really thought this through completely, but just wondering how pill testing would happen, because I saw an article shared on Facebook just prior to coming that said Rainbow Serpent had the opportunity to do pill testing and didn't do it or something, or, or how that would happen anyway, yeah. Okay, um, so I, I think, I'm not, I'm not aware of the article, but I don't know if the contents of that article were accurate, because at the moment in Victoria, there is no, it's not legally sanctioned to do pill testing. There's been one legally sanctioned pill testing uh, pilot, and that was in Canberra in April last year. Um, when we talk about pill testing or what in other parts of the world might be referred to as drug checking, uh, there's, there's a continuum in terms of the quality of the method. And what you often find is that the most rudimentary method, reagent pill testing, is conflated with the most sophisticated lab quality kinds of testing that is, that is integrated with a kind of um, counseling service that's not trying to dissuade people but trying to make people aware of the, the relevant risks and modify their behavior. So if you were to do pill testing at a festival, rather than saying, like just to give you an example about how they do it in um, at Boom Festival in Portugal, they have a tent not too dissimilar to the Dancewise tent at the back of their main stage and they offer, now that is run by a collective of uh, EU uh, drug checking services uh, like Energy Control in Spain and they work under a collective banner called the Cosmic Care Association. They offer thin layer chromatography at the back of the main stage and that is like um, people will wait for over an hour kind of thing in a queue. They'll get a result which, is, which can pick out from hundreds um, of different compounds and it can give you a breakdown of if there's more than one substance involved. If you were wanting to know uh, more like the strength, you'd probably need something more like a gas chromatography mass spectrometer, um, so a more sophisticated machine again. So with some of the substances which they're particularly concerned about, then that would be tested within the, the chill space, which is a few hundred meters further away within the cosmic care like care compound. Uh, the reason why it's a few hundred meters away, so the, the first layer of testing, thin layer chromatography is still a quality test. Um, that's close to the main stage because people can drag themselves away from the dance floor quite easily. And then when they're concerned about something or they want to even just know the strength of say um, a blotter with LSD on it, that would be tested at um, in a cargo container that has to be completely level and away from the vibrations of the dance floor. And those results will be done overnight. And so at a festival that's multi-day, you can offer kind of the more than one layer of testing. Uh, and then, then at the end, once you get the result, you're given um, information about the, the drug. But what is also really important is you're given that biopsychosocial messaging, which is it's never just the drug. It's always going to, whether there's a health disturbance from using any drug uh, will be determined by the set, so the physiology and the psychology of an individual, the setting in which they're taking it. So for example, one person, the same person takes one drug when it's 44 degrees, and then that very same drug, that very same person where it's 24 degrees, 
the likelihood of a health disturbance is significantly increased because of that increase in temperature. And so making people aware of that, have you been drinking water uh, consistently over the last 72 hours? Because whether or not you're hydrated adequately is, is impacted by your level of hydration over the last three days. It's prompting people to think like that. It's prompting people to think, do you have any other substance on board? Uh, for example, do, have you been drinking alcohol because the legal drug of alcohol is still a drug? Are you on any prescription medication? Do you have any health conditions which are hereditary that you maybe haven't detected yet? So it's the opportunity to think really laterally about what they're doing. Um, and when we're talking about drugs that are coming from an illicit market, even if you are able to get a lab quality testing that gives you a really quite uh, like quite reasonable indication of what the substance is, you're still using something from the black market, so it's not sterile, it's not of a, a pharmaceutical quality. So it's making people think in all of those terms and realizing like, hey, there's a lot of factors here that could influence this. So pill testing is not the single solution, it would be one factor in what needs to be a really holistic approach. Um, and what needs to be happening actually is um, education from uh, like non-discriminatory health education from quite an early age similar to how we have sex education um, and it's it's meant to be evidence-based and non-discriminatory it's not based on values it's based on actually knowing what are the what are the facts so yeah that's kind of how pill testing would work at a festival but yeah. thank you Steph uh, we've got time for one final question if somebody has a final question they would like to ask our panelists today. Paul. Um, I, I was seeing in the media about the police stopping people when they're leaving the festival, you know, and there's re massive punitive charges and everything, as well as the risk of having accidents and things. And I wondered if you, the panel could address that and what people could do to sort of uh, stop getting, uh, to stop those uh, things happening. Ban cars. <laughs> no, just kidding. I don't know. Does anyone else want to? Yeah. I'm happy to do it, but I feel like yeah. I'm talking too much. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm really sorry. I zoned out for like 20 seconds, but I, I kind of, if, if you, I'll give t like 30 seconds on roadside drive, driving, uh, drive testing. Uh, I, Sorry, I didn't, didn't hear the specifics of your question, but basically they're not testing for uh, presence. They're not testing for impairment or how well you are able to operate that machinery. They're testing for the presence of anything in your system, um, which is obviously unfair. There's obviously a, uh, like a disconnection with how that works with alcohol testing, um, and that's just the nature of, of currently illicit substances and how they work, and it's just illegal to even have it in your veins. Um, so... That's where that's at. I'll let Steph go into more detail. I don't even have my license, so I don't know. Well, I would discourage people. I, I really do kind of mean that when I say ban cars a little bit. Like, I waited till I was uh, 30 before I learned to drive a car. Uh, I think that if the, ve if the automobile was invented today, barely anyone would be allowed to have a license because it is just essentially a risk machine. Um, yeah, so... I would Back discourage people. Awesome yeah, <laughs> I would discourage people from um, taking any risks on the road because it, you are essentially transporting yourself in a weapon that can, like, it, it does. So many people lose their lives on the on the road, and it's really tragic. So, and it's not, but it's not just a, a drug-related thing. It's not just a case of well, if we if we lived in a drug-free world, there'd be no car collisions. Uh, we know that you have to be um, in a really uh, fit state to drive a vehicle. So I would say to people, if you want to come to a festival, and even if you're not using any substance, legal or not, uh, it is quite a wonderful place that you take yourself to. You get detached from all the like responsibilities of day-to-day -day life. You might be a little bit sleep deprived or a little bit exhausted. So driving a car, even if you were straight and narrow the entire long weekend, is quite a like quite a task. Um, so I would encourage people to you know uh, use the buses, use the trains, um, and at the very least. We say to people, if you've used illicit substances, 
you should be aiming to have about 72 hours between using and then driving. So that's most of the festival, bare minimum 24 hours. And you want to really make sure, have you, um, have you eaten? Have you slept? Have you slept a decent amount of time? Like, have you had eight hours sleep? Have you remained hydrated? How do you actually feel? Is your vehicle in a fit condition as you're leaving? Um, making sure that you're not taking any kind of additional risks, like packing your vehicle um, so you still have access to your rear view mirrors and all of those kinds of things. Yeah, so it's all about just taking a really practical approach. Um, and yeah, the, the roadside regime, um, it's a really political space as well, uh, but I think if people are just focusing on um, reducing the harms, that's the most important thing, rather than worrying about uh, avoiding going through the testing, because sometimes that adds uh, additional risks. People maybe delay going on the road until it's really dark or something like that. I, I would strongly discourage people from doing that. I would suggest that they either stay on site an extra day, or leave and without their vehicle and come back later in the week if they are remotely questioning their capacity to drive. And if you're not the driver and you think that anyone around you, whether they're someone, uh, an old friend or a new friend that you've met here, if you think that they're pushing themselves a little bit um, by leaving in a vehicle, uh, a bystander intervention is and, and showing love and support for your community is being able to intervene and say, you know, I think that you should wait or you should make alternative plans on how, how to get home. As we wrap up this afternoon, I just want to remind you that we have um, two real lawyers here. Uh, well, actually, I mean, Steph is also trained in, uh, uh, you're a trained lawyer. Yeah, she's a, there you go, so Steph as well. But we also have um, two lawyers w uh, from a legal firm, uh, Dugan George. I'll just get Sophie and Christina to stand up for a second. Uh, if you have any questions about legal issues, please go and speak to them about it. They'll be able to answer your questions. If you have a friend who might have a spot of trouble or if you know of, of somebody uh, who's at this festival, um, Go and chat to them or go get your friend and tell them to chat to them. Uh, they'll be here for a little while and um, we might or come past the DanceWise space and ask us if you would like to chat to them and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll organise something. Thank you very much. Thank you to Steph. Thank you to Nick. Thank you to Linda. Thank you to Melissa. And thank you to you for being here. And uh, there's another panel on next. See you later. <laughs>